It's good to speak with you this morning. I encourage you, uh, if you haven't got a copy of our sermon notes, to put your hand up. Someone will bring you a copy of our notes. Um, you hurt your arm, Ben. Jeez. And you can follow along as we, as we uh, work our way through. Three old folks were walking down the street together. One says, it's windy today. And the next one says, no, it's Thursday. And the third one says, so am I, let's have a cup of tea. Thank you to those who laughed and a slow clap from the back. That was wonderful. Thank you. It's Wednesday today. No, it's Thursday. Yes, so am I, let's have a cup of tea. Sometimes we talk at cross purposes, don't we? Sometimes says one thing and somewhere we get confused what the next person's saying. We get confused with our conversation. And I think something similar happens in our passage today. We're working our way through the Gospel of Mark. Jesus has been proclaiming his message about the coming kingdom of God from Mark 1.15. Let's read it together. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. We have seen Jesus proclaim the kingdom of God in word and in deed, healing the sick, casting out evil spirits. And in these last few chapters of 6 and 7 and 8 of Mark, we've seen Jesus doing some spectacular public miracles, feeding crowds of thousands of people, walking on water, recreating the miracles of Moses in a new and better way to emphasize that Jesus is the prophet that Moses had said would come. Mostly recently, Jesus fed a crowd of 4,000 and then was promptly criticized by the religious leaders, the Pharisees, who demanded to see a sign from heaven. And Jesus told them they will not be getting a sign. No sign will be given to this generation. That's what Mark says. When Matthew tells the same story, he records Jesus saying, you'll be given no sign except the sign of Jonah, which we took as an excuse to talk a little bit about that most maritime of Old Testament prophets and grumpy old men, Jonah. And so if you're wondering how long we've been out of Mark, well, it's been about four weeks now since we talked about the feeding of the 4,000. But we're back into it today. Our passage today follows an immediately from the feeding of the 4,000 and Jesus having a run-in with these religious leaders, with these Pharisees. Whether these events are from the same day, it's not clear. Whether some time has passed, we can't tell. But certainly the writer, Mark, wants us to keep these stories together as he tells the gospel message. Jesus has fed the 4,000. He's been criticized by the Pharisees. He's told them to get lost. And then we find ourselves in a boat with a practical problem. Verse 14 says, The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf that they had with them in the boat. It's not a big problem. It's not the end of the world concern, but it's something very practical. I'm hungry. Who brought the lunch? And they all look at each other and find that out of the bunch of them, there's only one fellow who's prepared, only one Boy Scout in the boat who's brought something along. They've just been handling basketfuls of bread on the lake, on the other side of the lake. And they've got into the what, and they've, but they've only got one loaf in the boat with them now. Maybe they weren't expecting to be heading back out on the water so soon. But then Jesus got into an argument with the Pharisees and gave the order, and suddenly they're back out on the water before they've got time to go to the shops. Remember last time Jesus got into an argument with the Pharisees? They had to leave the country. They ended up on the seaside, up in Tyre. At least this time, the disciples said, at least we're still only just going across the lake, not going out of the country. And it seems to me that Jesus takes this opportunity of them talking about bread to make a little pointed parable. Speaking of bread, he seems to say, be careful. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. And just like windy Thursday cup of tea, Jesus hears the talk about bread. It gets him thinking about yeast and his interaction with the Pharisees 
and he comes out with this parable of warning. We'll come back to what the parable was supposed to mean in a bit because whatever message Jesus was trying to get across to the disciples, they didn't get it. It went right over their heads because they were focused on their stomachs. They have a chat about the strange thing that Jesus just said and they decide among themselves that Jesus is criticizing them for not bringing enough bread. It is because we have no bread, they say. The thing is, though, they don't have no bread. Just like we don't need no education, they don't have no bread. They've got a loaf. It's not nothing. It's something. It might not seem like enough, but it's a start. But in their eyes, they're so busy grumbling at each other and criticizing They not only miss what Jesus is trying to tell them, but they make their own problem worse. It's not that they have no bread, they have one loaf. That's something. They get so upset with each other, they even forget about the loaf they've got. So Jesus gives them a lesson of reminder about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. He asks them a series of careful questions. Why are you talking about having no bread, he says? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? A series of questions designed to make the disciples examine themselves. And look beyond their immediate problem and concern to see a bigger picture. He takes them to two examples of things that have happened right in front of them in the previous few days, previous few weeks. Miracles in which they have had the front row seat. And he asks some more questions. When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. They remember this. They were there. They are the ones who picked up the basketfuls. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketful of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. Again, they were there. They were the ones who picked up the basketfuls. He said to them, do you still not understand? Jesus deals with their practical problem of not having any bread by reminding them quite clearly that when it comes to bread, Jesus knows what it's about. He's all over it. If he can take five loaves and feed 5,000 and have 12 baskets left over, and if he can take seven loaves and feed 4,000 and have seven baskets left over, then surely he can take one loaf and feed a dozen blokes in a boat. What are they even worried about? How is this even an issue? For us, this is just a matter of a few pages in our Bibles, a few hundred words. But for the disciples, this had been maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a few months. Maybe it never occurred to them that they were worth a miracle. Other people have needs. Other people have problems. But this is our own mistake, and we're just going to have to grin and bear it. This is our lot in life. There's no point complaining. No one ever listens. Have you ever heard someone say that? No point grumbling. No one ever listens. Well, we're listening. For goodness sake. We aren't told how this particular story is resolved. Did the disciples just sit there like a bunch of twits and go hungry? Or did they say, oh, yeah, sorry, Jesus. You're the one who can multiply bread. Hey, could you mind blessing, would you mind blessing this loaf so we can all have enough to eat? I wonder how you imagine this story finishing. Did they go hungry? Or did they ask Jesus to do a miracle with what they had? We are quick to criticize the disciples for their lack of faith, for their not getting it, for their hard hearts but I think we're often just the same today. We forget who Jesus is, and we forget what Jesus has done. 
And when we forget the who and what of Jesus, we very quickly focus on our own problems and on our own attempted solutions. We put Jesus aside and start doing the math for ourselves. One loaf, a dozen folks, someone's going hungry. But we need to remind ourselves of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Ask ourselves those diagnostic questions that Jesus asked the disciples. When things seem too difficult or too hard or too impossible, we need to turn back and listen to the voice of Jesus saying, do you not still see and understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? So often we are quick to forget who Jesus is and what he has done. You must look again at Jesus. Remind yourself of who it is that you serve, who bought you, who saved you, who redeemed you, who promises your eternal life. And with that reality in mind, look back again at the problem from God's perspective. This is one of the great values of gathering in church, of singing old songs and new songs, of telling old stories and new stories, of sharing our testimonies, of reading these verses from Scripture, practicing the sacraments, encouraging one another, because we are often so quick to forget who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. As we remember and recall and celebrate the ways that God has helped us in the past, we're encouraged to move forwards, knowing that God can and will help us today and into the future. That was Sermon 1. Let's turn back to the parable that started off this wonderful tangent. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. Jesus doesn't get much of an opportunity to explain the parable, and we aren't really told here in Mark what it means. But we know that yeast is something tiny that makes a huge difference. Jesus talks about yeast in a positive way in his parables. In Matthew chapter 13, you've got the reference there. I don't think I have it on the screen. Matthew 13, he tells the parable of the kingdom of God is like yeast that was mixed into a batch of dough and it got bigger and bigger and bigger and fed the whole village. In that way, he's talking about yeast in a positive way, that a small bit of good can make a big change. But here and elsewhere, Jesus talks about yeast in a negative way, of something small, something insidious, that gets into things and interferes and upsets and spoils. In the parallel passage to the one in Mark, in Matthew chapter 16, we read the same story but with some slightly different words. And at the end of that passage is out of this verse. Then they understood. He was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. If you've got an old King James, it'll say, warning you against the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In a similar vein, in Luke chapter 12, Jesus teaches his disciples to be on guard. Be on your guard, he says, against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. There's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, he says, or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. So we have a picture here of religious teaching described by Jesus as hypocrisy, which is the Greek word for acting, for pretending, for saying one thing but doing another. And Jesus warns that anything you do in that way will be made clear on the last day. Whatever you mutter in your heart will be broadcast to all the world. So be careful of hypocrisy. 
And again, in Matthew 23, Jesus gives warnings. He says, woe to you teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. There's an old English expression. He's like a dog in the manger. Has anyone ever used that expression, like a dog in the manger? A couple of you. What does a dog in the manger do? A dog lies in the manger. It doesn't eat the hay, but it stops the cows from eating the hay. Do you know where that reference, where that quote is from? From the Gospel of Thomas. Did you say that, Letitia? Where did you say it was from? No, it's not. It's from the Gospel of Thomas, which is one of those kind of Christian, not really, we don't read it at all, but it's an early gospel story about Jesus. And it sounds like something Jesus could have said about the Pharisees. A real dog in the manger, getting in everybody else's way. It's interesting that that saying's made it into some part of English language anyway. But here Jesus says, you shut the door of the kingdom of God in people's faces. You don't go in. and You don't let anyone else get in either. And it's to this hypocrisy that Jesus is pointing. But this is still all in the future for us here in Mark chapter 8. Here we have a, pass, a passing warning about the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. Now, the Pharisees are the religious leaders of the Jewish community, and Herod is the king that the Romans have appointed ruler over the Jewish people. The Pharisees on one side and Herod on the other side are normally enemies. They hate each other. But we've seen them come together because of their hatred of Jesus, because he's a threat to them both. And so here Jesus warns about the twin dangers of religion and politics, and not just because they ought not to be discussed in polite society, but it seems to me that religion and politics have a lot in common. They're about performance and obedience and activity. While faith is all about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, religion and politics are all about who I am and what I am doing. Your value in a religious system equates, your value in a religious system equates to how hard you work how much you study and give and pray and attend and follow the rules and follow the rituals. And really, politics is much the same. Your value to the politician is about how much tax you pay, about which laws you follow, which newspaper you read, about how you vote. And in many ways, religion and politics are spelt D-O, do. They reduce human beings to automatons, to robots, to things, whereas Jesus Christ calls people to trust in him and what he has, D-O-N-E, what he has done. Jesus has done it all. There's nothing I can add to his sacrifice or any way in which I can impress God with my hard work or my religious activity. All I can do is trust in who Jesus is And what Jesus has done. Are there any questions this morning before we conclude? I'm just going to get my water. If you think of a question, put your hand up. Any questions this morning? No? Fair enough. Yes, very done. I can't hear you, sorry. The yeast today, the yeast of the Pharisees is that legalism. That We'll get to that in a minute in my conclusion, but that legalism, that bit where I say, I have to do this and this and this and this in order to impress God. Whereas the reality is there's nothing I can do that will impress God. He loves me as much now as he ever will or ever, ha- or ever can. His love for me is infinite. And there's nothing I can do by being a good little boy that will make God love me more. And yet the trap of Christianity, the trap of our faith, is to turn our faith into a religion where we have a series of rules. 
You must dress this way. You must wear this. You must do that. You must stand. You must sit. You must cross yourself in the right way. You must kneel at the appropriate time. You must call the pastor, pastor. Gee, that annoys me. Please just call me David. If you must call me pastor, that's fine. But don't think that by calling me pastor, you're earning brownie points with heaven in heaven. Brownie points for our new English people. Um, how do I even explain brownie points? I have no idea how to explain brownie points. My apologies. It's, it's like getting special marks in heaven that God thinks tick. God's ticking all the boxes in heaven. And if I tick enough boxes, God will love me. That's not what God's like at all. The yeast of our day, the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod is that I need to work hard to impress God. Whereas you know what? God loves me more than those parents love that beautiful little baby today in their arms. There's nothing that baby could do that would make them love him, love him more or love him less. And the same with us. God loves us of infinite value because of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Thank you, Boita. A great question. To conclude this morning, I want you all, please, to close your eyes. Close your eyes and imagine. Imagine you walk out of church this morning and as you cross the road, you get hit by a bus. And when you open your eyes, you're standing before God on the day of judgment. And God looks at you in the face and says, why should I let you into my heaven? Why should I let you into my heaven? What would your answer be? Think about that. What would your answer be? Why should I let you into my heaven? You might answer, because... I went to church because I was baptized, because I prayed, because I had faith, because I read my Bible, because I was a good citizen, a good father, a good mother, a good student, a good worker, because I didn't kill anyone. And those are good answers, but they're not the right answer. Because however hard we trust in our good works, we will never be good enough. When God looks you in the face on judgment day and says, why should I let you into my heaven? Any answer that begins with, because I, is the wrong answer. The only answer we can give on that day is, because of who Jesus is, and what Jesus has done for me. Because of who Jesus is and what he has done for me. Jesus said to his disciples, do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And Don't you remember? Let us always be reminded. We stand before God not in our own strength, not because of the goodness things we have done, but because of who Jesus is and what he has done. You can open your eyes now. Thank you. This morning, I want to challenge you. If you think that your goodness and your righteousness, your good works, your religious activity will be enough to stand before God and God say, yeah, okay, you can come in. I pray this morning that the Lord God would speak to you, and cause you to see. It's only because of Jesus and what he has done we have any hope for this life or the next. Simple song to reflect on this morning. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. 
Father God, this morning, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for who he is and what he has done. Father, help us not to forget. Help us always to be reminded of the greatness of who Jesus is and what he has done. Father God, this morning, there might be people who are struggling with only having one loaf, not knowing what to do with whatever the challenge is that lies ahead of them, not having the strength or the skill or the whatever is needed. Father God, speak to that person and remind them that in the hands of Jesus, one loaf can feed a multitude. Father God, help us to bring whatever we have to you, for you to bless and to break and to use. Father God, if there's anyone here this morning who are listening on the video or over the radio, anyone who does not know you in a real and personal way, someone who's trusting in their own good works to save them, Father God, speak to that person just now by your Holy Spirit. Give them that funny feeling inside. Set their heart on fire. Give them itchy feet. Give them a scratch that can't be itched until they come close to you and fall at your feet. You must save you alone. Help us not to trust in our own good works, our own righteousness, our own religious activity. Help us to trust always in who Jesus is and what he has done. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Amen.